<laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff. This is the Sky and Telescope series. And I am very happy to have a regular ST columnist and a prolific science fiction writer, Jerry Oltian, with us today. Hey, Jerry. Hey, Frank. Thanks very much for having me. Well, thank you very much for talking, uh, being willing to talk about your column. And uh, it's fascinating stuff. So, um, Jerry, where, where are you located at? I'm in uh, Eugene, Oregon, Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you might suspect, it's uh, raining out now because <laughs> it's autumn and that's what it does in, in the Pacific Northwest in autumn. Yeah, so we're recording this on September 27th, 2021, and we are post-Equinox. Yeah, and boy, I tell you what, the season's hit with calendrical accuracy out here. Ooh, uh, awesome. Yeah, so uh, yeah, even though we got a new moon coming up, or probably because we have a new moon coming up, it's going to rain for the next week. <laughs> uh, uh. So I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and we have essentially two seasons, hot and less hot. Um, <laughs> and uh, today it actually rained a little bit in, in Phoenix, so we're, we've broken the summer high temp, so we'll, we'll go into the, uh, we're in the low 90s, upper 80s today, which is uh, quite pleasant for, for Phoenix, so very okay. cool. Cool. You have a very awesome scope over your, <laughs> your left, over your left. I got to get the parody left. There you go. Oh, yeah. what, what is that? Well, okay. I confess to, to uh, planting that back there in the oh, background. Shocking. Because it's my, uh, it's my latest project. Cool. One of the, one of the dangers of writing a column on uh, everybody else's telescopes is when somebody has a really awesome project, I want to do it myself. Ooh. And so uh, one of the very first columns I wrote back in 2016 was about a travel scope hmm. that fit in a little box, like uh, 10 by 12 by six, right? And uh, when it, I've been wanting to build one of those for years. It took me about four and a half years to build up my courage. And then it uh, took most of the summer for me to actually put it together. So that is uh, my nine and a half inch F4 travel scope. Cool. Uh, I'm waiting for things to open up a little bit, and I'm headed to the southern hemisphere with that. Thing. I was gonna say, I was gonna ask if you travel as in, you know, put in an airplane kind of travel. Um, yeah, it'll fit under an airline seat. It's uh, twelve and three quarters by twelve and three quarters by six inches when it goes in the box. Cool. Uh, yeah, well, that's with eyepieces too. <laughs> well, I wish you luck on your South American travels. Um, that is, uh, that is, remains on my bit bucket of things to do is to see the sky from the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, me too. I, I have been in the Southern Hemisphere. I've been in uh, Peru uh, a couple okay. of Okay. Every time I'm there, it's just solid clouds and I never saw the night sky. Oh so no. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go back, obviously. <laughs> right. I went to Australia oh, many years ago before I really got into um, astronomy much, but I did know enough to at least get a star map and uh, look up and notice that, hey, these are stars I don't know the names of. <laughs> so I did at least do that. <laughs> Very cool. So I'm going to pick that thread up uh, before you got into astronomy. So, so let me ask, how did you get into astronomy? Um, you know, I've been interested most of my life in, in a sort of an academic way in that uh, I'm a science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I write a lot of uh, stories set in space. And, uh, um, you know, so you have to know things like what are the nearest G type stars that are likely to have planets. And, you know, you learn these things because it's part of your job. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we had the, 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 you know, the usual little hobby killer spyglass with the <laughs> focuser that you push and pull, right? Right. And I remember seeing Saturn and noticing that you know, it did have something sticking out the sides that I could see that much. Um, so back in, I think it was 2003 or so, uh, Kathy and I were trying to decide what to do for Christmas. And it's like, you know, maybe we should just buy one big present for the both of us rather than try and buy presents. And you know, we talked it over and it's like, let's get a telescope and see if we can learn what the sky is like. And uh, so we bought an eight inch uh, Newtonian on an equatorial mount, okay. uh, you know, it was uh, motor driven, but not go to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we had a blast uh, learning our way around the sky and stuff. And then we started noticing that, you know, when we put in the higher magnification eyepieces, we couldn't see anything. It was all blurry and there mm -hmm. were halos around stars and stuff. <laughs> so we yeah. connected connected with the local astronomy club and uh, 
well, one of the first things they said is, you know, you've got yourself a piece of junk here. Uh, surprise, you're still in the hobby because this is a total hobby killer. And, uh, you know, that kind of piqued my interest. Like, well, what, what would be not a hobby killer? And uh, about half the people in the club had homemade telescopes. Ooh, really? Yeah, yeah. This, the, the Eugene Club is just full of telescope makers. And so, yeah, I got my introduction to good telescopes by looking through homemade telescopes. And uh, so I just assumed that if you wanted a good one, you had to make it yourself. And, uh, and that was that. <laughs> given, given that uh, preledication, I'm going to take a wild guess that you still have no go-to scopes. You are absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I've, I've, been, I've been down that uh, line of argument. I've argued this way and that. And I've finally come to understand that there's nothing, ab there's nothing wrong with a go-to scope. It's just not for me. Okay. Uh, the, the thing I love about astronomy is finding where something is in the sky and, and then tracking it down and, and seeing it, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's what I like doing. But, uh, you know, if I was an astrophotographer, I think I'd probably get myself a go-to scope. Okay. So you, uh, you do naked eye? Yeah, totally naked eye anymore. I was, I got into film astrophotography, you know, by, starting in 03, that was kind of at the beginning of the digital age, mm. um, the end of the film era. And, uh, you know, mm. I had a film camera and I stuck it on the telescope and uh, did some guided shots and had some reasonably good uh, results. But uh, I realized that I was spending more time fiddling with the equipment than I was doing astronomy. Yeah. So, you know, it was a question of, am I going to move on into the digital age with digital photography, or am I going to just go back to visual observing? And I chose visual observing, and that's been that way ever since. That's very cool. Very cool. Um, before we get into the article, let me, let me ask you, do you have any uh, adventure stories from the field? <laughs> well, talking about this telescope behind me, I had an adventure just a couple of weeks ago, oh. took it out to test. and. Uh, being a travel scope, you know, you can't get the altitude bearings um, large enough diameter to have the center of gravity right in the center of the altitude bearing. So you have to, you have to balance it with bungees, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's nose heavy. And uh, I uh, had my heaviest eyepiece in there and I have, I'm using rubber bands for bungees. And, uh, you know, they work really well. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't understand was when rubber gets cold, it loses its stretchiness. Mm -hmm. and so my telescope that was perfectly balanced in, in my house was a little nose heavy. I turned away to get uh, to actually to look in my uh, my sky and telescope pocket sky atlas TM no <laughs> no no plug um, and uh, I heard a little clunk behind me and uh, I thought you know my uh, observing companion must have must have tripped over his chair or something right didn't think much of it. And then I heard another clunk uh -oh. and, you know, yeah, like, and two or three seconds pass and another clunk, you know, and finally I turn around and look just in time to see my telescope tipping over forward and uh, falling right off of the table that I had it on. And then of course the bungees pulled the rocker box and the ground board down on top of it. Wow. And, oh, and then I heard that sound that nobody wants to hear. And that's the sound of your primary mirror landing on the gravel because it had busted loose from its mouth, uh, face down on the gravel. And so, yeah, there's three of us, uh, we all come rushing over to look and uh, we're standing there with our little red flashlights, just looking at the scene of the crime and nobody wants to touch anything, right? And mm -hmm. I'm studying this, trying to figure out what happened. You know, I'm just looking at the aftermath, trying to back it up in my mind to figure out what in the world happened. And, uh, the good news is that the primary landed on one piece of gravel and uh, there's a little divot about one millimeter square. Yeah, so, yeah you know, a piece of bird poop would be uh, worse than that. So, oh, <laughs> so no, no damage to the primary, no real damage to the scope. And I, uh, I realized what it had done is uh, it had rocked its way forward enough to where the altitude bearing had fallen off of the Teflon pad mm -hmm. and that extra little bump had just pitched it forward. And then it just went on over and fell out of the rocker box and down it went. Boom. So, 
I put, I put some, those. some lessons out of that one on uh, <laughs> rubber bands on how we can use yeah, better, yeah. better restraining I'm, system. I'm still using rubber bands, but I'm being much more cautious about uh, making sure that it's balanced at any given moment. Uh, that's that's yeah, yeah. and uh, and I put stops on it so that now if the altitude bearings do go to the end, they hit a stop. Yeah, good. Okay. And I also have a brake so that I can tighten up the handbrake when I take an eyepiece out. So uh, cool. Theoretically, I solved that problem. We'll see. <laughs> Sounds like you took it out more than once after that. So let's go ahead and get into this very lovely okay. Sky and Telescope article. Uh, and this is from the uh, 80th year anniversary issue and uh, where we are by Jerry and to build or buy. And Jerry, take us away. Okay. Uh, well, let me tell you the, the story of how this came to be. And that is uh, uh, my editor, Sean Walker, uh, emailed me and told me, you know, we're coming up on our 80th anniversary issue. And uh, used to be the case that uh, it was much cheaper to uh, build your own telescope than it is to buy one. But I don't know if that's true nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. He said, would, would you do the math and figure it out and maybe write an article about that? Cool. And uh, so, yeah, I was totally jazzed with the idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trying to figure out how am I going to make a positive article out of this because I was absolutely certain that you could buy a telescope cheaper than you could make it. Um, you know, I mean, they're 400 bucks now, right? <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for a good one. Uh, so, uh, you know, I started working my way through it. And uh, the first thing I did was I decided we're going to talk about an eight inch uh, Newtonian uh, Dobsonian mount. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that seems to be about the most bang for your buck. It's uh, the size telescope that I would call a real telescope. You're not likely to trade in an eight inch on a larger telescope, at least not in your first couple of years. Mm -hmm. you know, it'll take you a while to get tired of it. So I thought, okay, let's use that as our benchmark. And uh, I've always been fond of the Orion, um, uh, what, SkyQuest stops. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you shove forward a page on page two, there's one, uh, there's one uh, right there on the, yeah, that's, okay. yep, that Orion SkyQuest job there. That's my benchmark. I figured, okay, let's see if we can create our own telescope somehow, uh, you know, similar to that, one that would be equally functional. Mm -hmm. And uh, went online and discovered that that was going for 450. It used to be 375, wow. but uh, the price has risen to 450 recently because so many people are buying telescopes because they're home. Um, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the COVID crisis was the best thing that ever happened to amateur astronomy, yeah, it, at least to the manufacturers of telescopes, because they're selling telescopes like hotcakes. Yep. So price was 450 and that, that kind of, um, you know, that moved the barrier high enough to where now I felt like, okay, now we, ask, we have a contest here. It might actually be possible. And uh, so... Uh, uh, you know, I started doing the research and figured how much does it actually cost you to like grind your own mirror and uh, mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. And um, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I discovered is <laughs> kind of sad. Uh, going back up to the beginning, let's see. Oh, no, no, never mind. It's on. It's on the third page or so. Um, uh, there it is. Yeah, the primary <laughs> primary mirror there. Um, you can make your own primary or you can buy one and it turns out to be almost exactly the same price. It's gonna be about 250 bucks either way. Uh, and so it becomes a question of, are you the kind of person that wants to make your own mirror or not? And uh, you know, and, and what focal ratio, if you wanted to make a short focal ratio mirror, it'd cost you a little bit more to buy it. Um, on the other hand, it'll probably take you a lot more time to make it because Especially if it's your first one, you're going to have to learn how to parabolize a short mirror, and those are a lot harder. Um, yep. So, but uh, turned out, you know, you can make the mirror about the same uh, for about the same as you can buy a mirror. So that was good news. Um, and uh, go ahead. Let me do one thing. I want to go back up to this uh, this front picture here. <laughs> uh, uh, all of these, or some of these, are homemade. Let's see. The ones on the ones on the left are all commercial telescopes. You've got uh, the um, 
Actually, yeah, that the one that you're the one in front, the kind of light blue one there, that is uh, an Orion SkyQuest daub um, that I borrowed from my neighbor, actually. <laughs> and uh, you know, you behind it, you've got a Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. Yeah. Um, little short tube 80 over there, the white one. Mm -hmm. uh, Galileo scope behind it, the uh, the one that was uh, put out um, uh, a few years ago as a, a very inexpensive kit. Uh, and then, of course, the Astro scan down on the bottom. And uh, and then over on the right, if you go to page two, you'll see over on the right, those are all homemade scopes. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that, uh, I should point out the uh, <laughs> the person that is being uh, uh, more or less uh, <laughs> like assaulted, nice. perhaps. <laughs> yeah, that's my wife, Kathy. And uh, hey, Kathy, come here, go over and lean in. Oh, sure. <laughs> Hello, Kathy. <laughs> Hello, Frank. How are you? I am doing super duper today. Great. You, you take a great picture there. Did you did you eventually make a decision on the left or the right? Oh, I'm still dithering. You're still dithering. <laughs> Very cool. Thank so, you. So the fun bit was, you know, we set up all these telescopes and we put uh, all the commercial scopes on one side and all of the homemade scopes on the other side. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got this, you know, they started kind of taken on a life of their own and we started piling them all together and uh, we aimed them toward the center where we figured Kathy would stand and I stood back with the camera and I realized they look like they're alive and they look like they're they look like they're waiting for a decision yeah and, uh, oh, we took a, a, a million photos of Kathy you know whole, you know rubbing her chin and scratching her head and all that stuff and she just at one one moment she just kind of vamped that you know what do we what do we know kind of a expression and that was it i snapped that photo and we looked at it on the screen it's like well we're done you know <laughs> and, and uh, when i sent the photos to sean my editor uh you know along with the article i didn't send him any choices for uh, the front spread i just said this is it you know <laughs> there's no question at all this is the photo <laughs> And, uh, you know, I, I just thought it illustrated the point so well, you know, you've got the commercial scopes on one side, the, uh, the uh, homemade scopes on the other, and, uh, you know, wh which do you choose? Yeah, and, and actually, the answer is, you know, almost all of the scopes, the only one that's not our telescope is the uh, Orion Dobb. Mm -hmm. um, and I have owned the Orion Dobbs before, but I keep winding up giving them away. <laughs> So they're just such great telescopes, you know. Somebody says, "I need a telescope." It's like, "Oh, I got one here," you know, <laughs> and off it goes. Nice, nice. So, yeah, sw switched up to the next page, and I'll show you some of the others. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, I guess they're. Uh, yeah, the only one that's really obvious is that great big one. That's a twenty-inch scope, okay. um, which I did not actually make. I I bought that from Mel Bartels, who made that. He's a master telescope maker out here in the Pacific Northwest. Mm -hmm. And uh, he wanted to make a uh, 25 inch telescope. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, I, Kathy and I were looking for a big scope and I was telling Mel, you know, I, I'd kind of like to buy a 20. And he said, why don't you buy mine? And he said, I need the money to build my 25 inch. <laughs> and so, uh, mm -hmm. so we did that. And so I've been using that scope a lot and, uh, you know, enjoying the heck out of it. Cool. And, of course, every time I drill a hole in it, Mel winces and like, oh no, you know, you're ruining my telescope. And it's like, dude, it's my telescope now. <laughs> uh, indeed. I tell people, you know, you don't really own a telescope till you've drilled a hole in it. There you, you go. You know, when, you, when, you, when you started modifying it, now it's your telescope. <laughs> oh, awesome. And we covered some of the mirrors and there's the... Uh... Yeah, so... Uh, so basically, you know, once you get to the mirror, you've, you've spent about 250, 270 uh, mm -hmm. to get your mirror. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, so you're still kind of even odds, you know, uh, buy or build, you, you're at the same price point. And, uh, you know, I, I have a, a friend who, <laughs> who said, I don't hate anybody enough to teach them how to make a secondary mirror. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> We, uh, we almost all just buy our secondary mirrors. It's so much harder to make a flat mirror than it is to make a spherical or a parabolic mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, again, you know, you can buy the secondary uh, and they're relatively cheap, you know, $30, $40, $50 for the, you know, 10th wave uh, 
enhanced coated one, you know. Yeah. Um, but then you get into the part where you can really start saving some money. Um, you know, a, a commercial scopes probably gonna have a metal tube. You know, Coulter used to use cardboard tubes, but that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, most everything's in a metal tube, and you know, those are expensive. Uh, cardboard tubes, on the other hand, are dirt cheap. You know, 10, 11 bucks will get you a sono tube. Um, and, uh, you know, that's well, actually a pretty darn good uh, housing for an eight inch mirror. Um, it's thick, quarter inch thick, uh, rigid as all get out. Your scope's not gonna flex uh, going from zenith to the horizon. Yep. And so yeah, you know, I just chose, okay, you know, 10 inch so sono tube for an eight inch mirror. Uh, turned out to be eleven dollars. So yeah, not not a big deal. Can't beat that. No. And then uh, you know, then you go to the uh, to the base. Uh, you know, the the plywood for the base uh, and the mirror box. Um, plywood's gotten really expensive. Also, you know, one of the other effects of the COVID uh, pandemic was everybody stayed home, and everybody thought, oh, I'm going to finally do that remodeling project I've been wanting to do for twenty years, right. and the price of lumber just went through the roof. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, so plywood's not as cheap as it used to be, but it turns out, you know, you can still buy an eight, a four by eight sheet of um, what's called AD grade. It's A grade on one side, so it's going to look really nice on the outside, and the inside's going to be horrible, but yeah. nobody right. cares, <laughs> right? So, yeah, and you can buy that for about 50 bucks. Yeah. Um, right. So, uh, yeah, and you can get the entire uh, wooden parts of the telescope uh, out of one sheet of plywood. Oh, yeah. uh, and in fact, you'll have some left over. So in a way, I, I kind of I cheated a little bit by saying, well, you're not going to use the whole piece of plywood. So, uh, you know, I, I said you're going to use about uh, two thirds of it. So 33 bucks instead of 50 bucks for the plywood. But this means you're going to have to build another telescope to use that savings. There you go. Uh, <laughs> so there you go. You got to figure that in. Uh, let's see. Then from there, I guess, uh, you know, we got, um, let's see, the eyepieces. I basically said, you know, steal some from a pair of binoculars. That's what John Dobson did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. you know, so you can get a pair of binoculars at Goodwill for 10 bucks. So I figured, all right, 10 bucks for the eyepiece. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Secondary mount down there on the left. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. that's a, a cedar shake, a cedar shingle uh, split. And uh, the wooden part is, uh, a, you know, a piece of uh, a wooden dowel, probably the handle of a rake or a mop or something. Yeah. Uh, so you can make your secondary mount for free. I mean, you, you can find stuff laying around. If you don't want to use cedar shingles, you can use a hacksaw blade or, or uh, you know, somebody gets something delivered on a pallet. You've got those metal packing strips. Those make great secondary spiders. So I figured, okay, you can scrounge that, so you don't have to pay anything for your for your spider. Okay. And uh, scoot over to the other picture just beside that. There's your uh, there's your fancy mirror cell, mm -hmm. piece of that same AD grade plywood, three bolts sticking up from below, and uh, padded with pieces of masonite so that the bolts don't actually just clack against the glass. And uh, the masonite's held in place with a little sheet sheet of cardboard cut from a cereal box. So, uh, you know, cost of the bolts is about it because you already bought the plywood. And, uh, and then up in the tube there, you can see the stops that hold the uh, mirror, keep it from falling forward. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the simplest and best um, mirror mounts uh, I've ever run across. And again, you know, stolen straight from John Dobson's design. So it's been thoroughly tested many times by countless telescope makers. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know that uh, both ends of the telescope, uh, the, the OTA, um, essentially free. You know, just scrounge the parts, and uh, and you can make yourself a secondary spider and the uh, and the uh, actual mirror cell. Mm -hmm. So let's see what's on the next page. I've actually forgotten where we went from there. Oh yeah, focusers. Yeah, and yeah, this is the this is the moment where you know. If you buy a nice Crayford focus here, it's going to be about 150 bucks. And, uh, you know, that threw us way over the $450 mark. Yep. And so it's like, okay, well, make your own focus here. And this is where it gets kind of fun. I mean, you know, not very many people actually make their own focus here. 
uh, but I've done it a couple of times, especially when I needed an extremely lightweight uh, upper end. And you know, so I, I learned how to make really lightweight focusers. And, and you know, I've, I've got instructions for how to do it on my website. I wrote an article, actually Gary Saronic wrote the article about it back when he was doing the telescope uh, workshop column before I, uh, before I got the job after he moved on. Um, so yeah, he wrote about that back in one of the early issues. Uh, and uh, you know, it's still there and it's on my website, how to build a very basic um, Crayford, it's a one speed, but uh, the, the little uh, drive shaft there is so small in diameter that it's a, basically a very, very fine adjustment uh, focuser, especially if you use big knobs. You know, the, bigger, the bigger the knob, the easier it is to get a fine adjustment. Yep. And I will point out that that, uh, that drive shaft is in fact a knitting needle that I got from Kathy. So thank, <laughs> thank you for the drive, the drive shaft there, Kathy. You're welcome. <laughs> I hope she got oh, yeah. for knit, knit, uh, knitting. Um, oh yeah, well, we'll, uh, we'll put a we'll put a link to your website in the description below the video. So those are. Oh, oh yeah, sure, that'd be great. It's just jerryoltian.com, but you got to learn how to spell Oltian, which is always a trick. <laughs> so O L T I O N. O L T I O N. I'm I'm used to that now. I finally got it right after about fourth or fifth grade. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, then the other thing would be a uh, finder. And, uh, you know, again, you know, um, you can buy a Telrad or a Rigel and they work great. I love them. Uh, but you can also make your own finder. And in order to keep the cost down, uh, that was what I suggested in the article, you know, make either um, the, the little spindly one on the stick is what I call a split pupil finder, uh, okay. where you're looking through the lens at an arrow. And the only function that the lens does is it makes the arrow focused on infinity. Um, you know, it's like holding a magnifying glass up to something, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to get a better look at it. That's what you're doing with the arrow. It focuses on infinity. So when you move your head around, the arrow stays put. And then you just look over the lens at your target. And uh, it's called a split pupil finder because you've got light coming through the lens at, into your pupil and into your eye and coming over the lens into your eye at the same time. Mm -hmm. That top, the top edge of the lens is right there halfway across your pupil. And you can move your head up and down to look through the lens or through the, uh, or just over the lens at the target. And the arrow starts to fade in and out. And, oh, cool. and it's kind of neat. That arrow gets really strong and then it kind of fades away and you can see your target behind it. And you just move that arrow around until you're centered. Uh, I'd say about two thirds of the people that I show this to hate it. They just absolutely can't stand it. Oh, and God. yeah, because it's kind of hard to, it's hard to get, it's hard to figure out. It's hard to get your eye placed right. Um, it's hard to actually kind of comprehend what you're doing with this thing. Um, but it is, but, it has but, a fairly simple. Yeah, it is. It, that's the thing, you know, it, um, it, it's, it's one of those things you, you either get it or you don't. And if you do, you love it. And, and if you don't, or, you know, if you just uh, don't have any good luck, if, you know, aiming it at your target. A lot of people get the concept and they still don't have very good luck with it. So, so you know, it's a, it's one of those deals. You, I think everybody ought to try it and see because if you're the kind of people that love it, you're going to really love it. Um, but there's the peep sight finder there on the right for the people that don't like the split pupil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a peep sight is so intuitive. I don't know anybody that hasn't figured out how to use that. And, and they work really well too. You can get within half a degree with a peep sight finder. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just made with wooden lath. Um, you know, and a piece of uh, address label up front to make a, a little white target so you can see it in the dark. But uh, those finders are really simple to make and they, they cost you nothing if you've got a scrap wood pile. Which you do. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you, can always, you can always cut a little chunk of that plywood that you got left over if nothing else works. Yeah. So uh, I think, let's see, let's back off and see what else is on that page. I think I, I got ahead of myself with the mount. We've already talked about that. Uh, yeah, that's the, uh, the uh, rocker box on its ground board down there below, uh -huh. just made out of, out of uh, plywood. You know, and you can get fancy and make yourself an eyepiece rack like I did there. I didn't include that in the price, but, uh, you know, another dollar or so for the plywood. But the end result. Uh, I was really excited. The end result, I came in at $398 for the homemade telescope. 
and $450 for the more or less equivalent uh, commercial telescope. Um, surprised the heck out of me. I was, I was really sure that uh, you just couldn't make an eight inch top cheaper than you could buy one these days. Um, so it was, it was kind of exciting. It's like, okay, um, manufacturing has, has gotten to the point where, you know, we can manufacture, you know, and mass produce better mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I got to say Orion's mirrors are, are superb. I, I've not ever found an Orion telescope with a bad mirror. You know, so whatever they're doing, they're doing it right. And I have produced many terrible mirrors and had to re redo the parabola several times before I got it right. And so it's like, you know, if uh, if that's not your thing, if making mirrors isn't something you find fun, then just buy a mirror and make a telescope with that. Uh, you can still get it in just, just under the wire. You can make it cheaper than, uh, than your... Uh, commercially uh, available version, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, it, it's kind of neck and neck. It's $398 versus $450. Although the price of the commercial scopes will keep going up uh, as demand outpaces the supply, right? right. Uh, I, in fact, I think there are, by the time the article was published, it was already like uh, $480 instead of $450 uh, for an eight inch dog. Now you're getting now you're good. Um, yeah, and I think as you you head off here on the, the obligatory the, cat, we, we, what was that? Oh, there's oh, the, the, obli the obligatory awesome. internet cat just came through. Yeah. All right. Well, now it'll be a very popular video because we have an internet cat. That's right. Yeah, the readership just went up ten yeah. percent. <laughs> um, so we did. We covered pretty much the eight inch was sort of the the standard, but um, you know, is is the general sense that uh, as the size gets bigger, it's more competitive to make it yourself versus buying, and also the other way, smaller, uh, you know, small travel scopes. Is that uh, uh, something that's cheaper to make or to buy? Well, here's the deal. Yeah, the, when you get into the large apertures, for sure, it's cheaper to make it. Um, you know, I, I I did the math again for a 16 inch. Okay. Uh, and figured, uh, you know, what would it cost for the blank and the coating and stuff? And, uh, you know, it turned out uh, you can do a 16 inch scope for about 1500 bucks. Okay. And uh, I started looking, well, who sells the cheapest good 16 inch scope? And um, came up with the Mead Lightbridge, uh, and that's uh, $2,200. Mm -hmm. So the uh, so the difference actually, you know, the, the gap gets wider and wider the larger the aperture. Um, but also, you know, the difficulty of making it gets uh, uh, more and more as well. Right. So, you know, you have to factor in your time. And obviously, none of my calculations uh, paid a wage for my time. Right. And, uh, you know, and I don't think it should because, it, you know, if you're building a telescope, you should be doing it because you want to build a telescope, you know, because it's fun mm -hmm. and you're enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. um, the experience. You know, yeah, yeah, just for the experience of doing it. And, uh, you know, and the joy of looking at something in the sky through a telescope that you built yourself, it, it is a significant difference. Um, you know, I have, I have lots of commercial made telescopes that I take out observing from time to time and I have my own homemade scopes. And I have to say, I just, I enjoy looking through my homemade scopes more. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if I have one that, you know, the mirror isn't quite as good as the commercial scope. Um, I still enjoy my own scope and it's, it's just the way you're built, I think. Satisfaction. Yeah. And then I guess, okay, on the other end of the scale, the, the little ones, the, you know, like um, a short tube 80, for instance, uh, you know, an 80 millimeter F, F5, um, so it'd be a 400 millimeter focal length. Uh, in the same issue, I've got uh, an article um, just, to, just a couple pages beyond this one, in fact. <laughs> Uh, that talks about making a short tube 80 um, with a lens that you can buy from a surplus shed. Uh, turns out, you know, the same uh, run on telescopes that uh, has raised the prices everywhere ran them out of lenses. So at the, la the last I checked, they were out of stock. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the owner says they're they're you're getting another batch in soon. So you can buy a lens. Um, and it's a doublet. It's an achromatic doublet lens. Uh, you can buy it for like $42. Wow. And, uh, you know, and you can use, a, a, um, what is it, galvanized tin flashing for the body. Mm -hmm. And, 
you can even buy a little plastic focuser also from a surplus shed. And, uh, you know, all together, uh, let's see, well, I, I've got the article here. <laughs> let, me, let me flip ahead and see what, what was my last, what was the number I came up with? Um, 200? Um, no, it's less than a hundred bucks. Ooh, wow. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I, I'd have to read the article to find the actual number. Oh, and there you go, somebody. There, there, there's your key. <laughs> I wrote this a couple months ago, so it's like I've totally forgotten the number, and I can't find it easily. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, you know, less than hundred bucks, and uh, you can make yourself a little short tube eighty. And uh, I think they they go commercially for a couple hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will point out that you know. The cheap plastic focuser is not as good as the one you're going to get on a genuine short tube 80. And the lens itself, maybe, maybe not. Um, I, I bought, I think, four of these lenses. Three of them were really good. One of them, not so much. Um, you know, uh, you can buy lenses uh, direct from uh, China for, oh gosh, $20. Uh, you know, uh, airspace doublet, but you have to make your own cell for it and stuff. So, you know, I mean, you can get the parts really cheap, um, but, you know, you get down down to that level, you know, a couple hundred bucks will get you a, a star blast, four and a half inch star blast, okay. um, pretty good scope. You know, I'm not sure that I want to go to the trouble to make a four and a half inch scope if I could buy one that good for a couple hundred dollars. Um, you know, again, the only reason to do it is because you want to. <laughs> Labor of love. Yeah, that's it. And, and that's the thing I try and emphasize in my regular monthly column too, is, uh, you know, we're not necessarily building these things to save money. We're building these things because we're having so much fun at it. Right. <laughs> Applying your skills, learning new skills. It's, it's, it's a yeah. process and that's invaluable. <clears throat> um, cool. Well, Jerry, thank you very much for walking us through that particular uh, 80th anniversary issue on to build or to buy um, and, and uh, you know you've got a regular column so where, uh, uh, where where do we go from here uh, where does the community go over the next five years might there be some some interesting articles coming up in s &T or oh yeah oh yeah um, let's see one thing that I'm working on right now is another article on uh, grinding your own mirror mm -hmm. um, turns out it's been about a decade since we've had an article in the magazine about mirror making Mm -hmm. And uh, there have been some advances, mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not, in the last 10 years or so, there have been quite a few advances. Uh, and, you know, people are making shorter and shorter mirrors and learning how to parabolize it down to like F2, <laughs> which, yeah, which, uh, you know, when, when I was reading uh, Jean Texero's uh, book, you know, on, you know, it's kind of the Bible of mirror making. You know, he's talking about how you know f5 is kind of fast uh, you know and it's very difficult to parabolize at f5 and you know now we're doing half that f2.5 people are doing that all the time um, so and, and, and also rather than aluminum coating people are silvering mirrors and they're going back to doing that home chemistry so in a way you know we're going full circle we're going back to the home silvering um, to uh, to cut costs because mirrors are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and coating a 30 inch mirror. First off, find somebody who's got a coating chamber that big other than Kit Peak, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, be prepared to pick your teeth back up off the ground after you find out what it's gonna cost. So, uh, you know, but silvering a couple hundred dollars, you can coat a 30 inch mirror. So yeah, anyway, I'm writing an article about that. Nice. And, uh, I'm writing an article about that, the, uh, the um, travel scope. Even though it's based on an article I wrote back in 2016, I'm doing another article about the design decisions that went into it. Mm. You know, it, it, it's not about how to build this particular telescope, it's about how, how you think your way through a telescope making project. So uh, I'll, I'll be doing that. And uh, let's see, I've got one coming up on a completely new different design of binocular telescope uh, using lenses uh, and running the light path of one scope right through the light path of the other scope in order to get the interpupillary distance close mm -hmm. enough to actually um, you know, look through both telescopes simultaneously. Um, not necessarily a brand new idea, it's been around forever, but nobody's actually done it. Uh, not that I know, but there's, 
two people here in Oregon that are uh, that are doing this, and I've been looking through their telescopes, and it's like, no, I've got to get this out there, get other people involved, and, and get this idea out where people can start uh, building their own. So that's coming up. Um, we do a master class video series on telescope making. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I still feel I feel like I'm a total amateur at this. I'm I'm surrounded by people that taught me how to do it, right? So I'm still I'm still kind of in the shadow of my mentors here, and um, you know these guys are really good. <laughs> well, I'm almost half serious on that. Um, I'll think about that. Very cool. <laughs> All right, Jerry, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us and walking us through your current article and people looking forward to future articles. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the, uh, the attention and the time. Thank you. And that'll do everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye all. -bye. Bye -bye.